um, thank you for the introduction. And as you heard, I will talk about from research results to company formation in the fight against disseminated cancer. And um, I think that I will start with um, explaining the, the research area that I work within, targeted alpha therapy. And uh, in order to do that, I will first uh, say a few words on uh, radioactivity. So everyone is on the same page here. Um, as you probably know, radioactive isotopes or nuclides are unstable elements. Uh, they transform from one element into another. Uh, to the right here, you see the decay chain of actinium, which is a medically relevant nuclide, and it decays into a lot of different uh, chemical elements before ending up in stable bismuth. Um, throughout this talk, I will, I will talk about mothers and daughters, and uh, that is the starting nuclide is the mother. The new nuclide that it transforms into is the daughter, and there can be many daughters or only one. And finally, we end up in something stable. Um, Half-life is also an important um, factor here. It's simply a measure of how quickly a radioactive isotope decays. It can range anything between 10 up to minus 24 seconds to 10 up to 24 years, uh, which, well, can be considered to be fairly stable. But um, in the medicine, we are in the range of, um, well, say from uh, minutes up to uh, a couple of days or weeks. And also the most common types of decay that we deal with is beta minus, it's electrons. We have beta plus, it's positrons or electron capture. And of course, <clears throat> the alpha particle, which is the interesting uh, one here, uh, which is simply a helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. And as a consequence of uh, these uh, types of decay, we can have some gamma uh, radiation which is photoelectric radiation in the same way as light, but with a much higher energy. And all these types of, um, of uh, radiation is ionizing. So it can uh, ionize uh, molecules and atoms and break chemical bonds and so on. So in targeted alpha therapy, as the name suggests, alpha particles is the interesting thing. Uh, why is that? Well, they have a very short range in tissue uh, between 100 micrometers, so they don't move far, but they have a very high energy between four and nine mega electron volts, which means that they have a very high local ionizing potential. So they ionize uh, molecules around them to a very high degree. And this means that we have a large probability of a DNA double strand break in the body. And this makes alpha particle emitters very suitable for treating microtumors or even single cancer cells without damaging healthy tissue in a very large extent. But we need to get the radioactive um, isotope to the tumor cell. And that is the targeting part. Um, and to be able to perform targeting, we need a vector, something that we attach the radioactive nuclide to. It can be an antibody, which is the most common, um, common vector to use within alpha therapy, but it can also be a peptide, a small molecule, uh, really anything that labeled with radioactive nuclide targets <clears throat> either a tumor specific or an overexpressed structure or function on the tumor cells and uh, taking the, uh, the radioactive payload to the tumor and then killing it. But it's very important to be able to match the vector with the nuclide and with the indication or treatment modality. So you match these three things in order to get the optimal combination. So looking at the nuclide, uh, there are really not that many alpha particle emitting nuclides that are relevant um, for therapy. We have astatine, actinium bismuth, a lead bismuth system, uh, thorium, and also radium. But uh, what are the features that we're looking for here? Well, um, we don't want to have a serial de uh, decay where we have a lot of daughters. These are new chemical elements and they can leave the vector and dislocate in the body and cause toxicity. We also don't want to have daughters that are toxic in themselves. 
that have a very high gamma emission or a long-lived particle emission, for instance. What we want is something that we can produce, which is really important because you can find the most perfect nuclei, but if it's not possible to produce it in, in large amounts, then it's not relevant. Also, we need a chemistry that is making it fit for labeling, for attaching it to the vector, and a half-life that is suitable. The 10 up to minus 24 seconds is not really important. So this is what we want. And when we take all these things into account, the one that ticks most of the boxes, it's acetine 211, which of course is the one that we work with here in Gothenburg. And why is acetine so good? Well, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this picture, but the half-life is good, 7.2 hours. It makes it suitable for a lot of treatment options and we can also handle it and ship it. So it's short, but it's long enough. We have um, character characteristic x-rays uh, that makes it possible to image the patient with SPECT and also to detect the nuclei in, in the laboratory environment. If we don't have any x-rays or gammas, this is really tricky. Uh, we have a very low abundance of high energy gamma photons, which is good when it comes to radiation protection. And also we only have one alpha per decay, 100% alpha emission. And this really simplifies those calculations, which is important when you calculate uh, how much activity you will have to give to the patients and so on. And we have no uh, serial decay and no potentially toxic daughters. So therefore, astatine is really the best option uh, for, um, for a curative treatment within targeted alpha therapy. Okay, so what have I been doing? Uh, well, Automation from target to drug with acetine 211. Why is that interesting at all? Well, it's more or less necessary in order to get clinical grade production of acetonated radiopharmaceuticals. You can do a small clinical phase one trial with a manual production. It has been done here in Gothenburg by my colleagues before uh, I started working in the research group. Um, but if you're gonna go to a larger clinical study, to a multi-center study, then automation is necessary. And of course, also, if the, the treatment that you're investigating will be used for uh, clinical uh, use routinely, then automation is also uh, necess necessary. And um, also, if you have an automatic approach, you really uh, simplify uh, targeted alpha therapy research and clinical trials with astatine globally. It's, there's a lot of interest in the nuclide, not that many have the infrastructure built up, uh, the chemistry is a bit tricky, so if you can provide an automatic um, uh, solution, then a lot of people that sit with a perfect tumor vector can have the possibility to try it with astatine and perhaps find a very good treatment option. Um, also, how has this been done and what was our approach? Well, we wanted to do an automatic procedure from target to drug. What does that mean? Well, um, astatine is produced in a cyclotron. That is uh, a large machine where you have a, a target material, in this case, bismuth, that is bombarded with alpha particles. And they, in turn, uh, transforms the bismuth to astatine. And what we get sort of the product from the uh, cyclotron is this metal plate that you see here to the left and we can't really give this to a patient and we can't do anything chemical with it so we need to work up astatine from this metal plate uh, and transform it into something that is chemically useful and once we have that product from the workup then we can do a radio pharmaceutical synthesis and our whole idea was to incorporate all these three steps uh, into one equipment. Okay, so when did it all start? How did uh, my research results finally turn up into a company? Well, in 2012, we started really realizing this work on an automatic approach. And it started with me as, uh, being a postdoc in the targeted alpha therapy group. And together with my uh, supervisor there, then Sture Lindgren, we started working on, on realizing this, uh, this idea that he had from the beginning. And the targeted alpha therapy group, it's a multidisciplinary research group. We have uh, chemistry, physics, medicine, 
and uh, we are situated at the uh, Sorgensk Academy and belong to the University of Gothenburg and also the, the Sorgensk University Hospital. Um, the research group's focus is internal radiation therapy of micrometastases, um, utilizing alpha particle emitting nuclides, and the main focus is astatine 211, and also uh, antibodies labeled with astatine and targeting ovarian cancer. So that's sort of the, the research group's uh, main focus area. Um, so in 2012, we started our work. The first results were really promising. We managed to, uh, to get the equipment, well, giving some results. And uh, already from the beginning, Stura had the idea that we should patent this. No one has done this uh, automatically. So this is really worth uh, looking into. So the next year, I should say that we started in November 2012. Uh, so the next year, in 2013, we contacted um, GU Holding, so the Gothenburg University Holding Company. They are now called GU Ventures. And also Synagon, which is a um, patent coordinating uh, company. And Synagon did an IP analysis and saw that, okay, patenting, it's, it could be possible to do this. And of course, in the same time, we continued working with our uh, equipment and prototype, and we really got it working in, I would say, 2013-14. Uh, but then all help from uh, GU Holdings stopped, and uh, me and Studa together, uh, we decided that we should go ahead and try and patent this anyway. So we sent in the patent application to the USA uh, in 2014 in order to get a priority date because this is really important. Otherwise, you can't publish research results and publications are very important in our line of business. So we did that ourselves. It's not very, um, very um, expensive. Also, we got help from Synagon. So this was sort of the start of the, um, of the whole commercial story, if we say, say it like that. So we have the priority date and then everything starts to, to roll. The, the clock starts ticking. Um, and therefore, we needed to start looking for support again. We were in contact with ALMI, with the Research and Innovation Office at uh, Gothenburg University. We received some small funds from ALMI, VFT funds, but you, it was really, really difficult to find any money for the patenting process itself. It's, it's almost uh, impossible, actually. So um, we were approaching deadline. We had to uh, send in uh, another application if we wanted to do this PCT um, patent application, which is really beneficial. If you get a positive PCT application, then it's much more easy to get uh, your real patent uh, approved. So uh, again, we had to do this on our own, me and Sture. It's still not very expensive, so we could do this with our private funds. And Synagon helped us with the, um, the whole uh, um, the process. Uh, so we sent it in. And also, we, this year we got our first results published um, in scientific reports, because of course, as soon as we had our priority date in 2014, we, worked, we started working on getting uh, the results out and published, but that takes a while. And uh, so in 2015, it was published. And um, also the PCT application was filed and it was very well received. Uh, I think all of our 27 claims were found inventive and so on. So this really, encouraged us to, to continue. But the next step here is the national phase uh, um, patenting. And that's really, really expensive. And we could not afford this with our private money. So we, re we needed uh, support. And again, the clock is ticking constantly. And really, just uh, when it, time was running out, we came in contact with Chalmers Ventures and their tech transfer program. That was... Uh, our uh, lifesavers, uh, because they were financing early patenting, patenting and, and early phase projects. And so they took us on because they thought that our idea, our patent and our project was interesting. And that was really, really good for us, because then we could start our national phase patenting in the US, China, Japan and Europe. This also meant, of course, that Charmers Ventures took over the rights to the patent. It was not, not low, no longer ours. And we, we still kept Synergon in the process because they have been helping us throughout the whole, the whole um, journey and knew more than anyone about this pot, uh, patent. 
Um, of course, in the meantime, our regular research work is continuing. Uh, but in 2017, we started looking for a business partner together with Chalmers Ventures, someone that could manufacture a commercial version of our equipment because the equipment, you see that on the left picture down here, uh, no one can use this in a clinical setting, um, not even another research group, it's not very easy. We need to package it into something commercial that someone else can use, otherwise it's, uh, it, there is no point in, in uh, trying to uh, put this forward. And the idea then was to sort of employ a sort of licensing agreement with the patents in order to be able to get someone to produce the equipment. And we are having a lot of contacts with different companies and everyone is very positive. And in 2018, a German company takes us up on the offer. We uh, apply for money together. We get uh, 2.5 million. Uh, great. And then the company management changes and they drops off and we have to give the money back and we're back at square one. So that was, uh, that was a downer, but uh, we didn't give up. And I would think that is sort of the take home lesson in this trying to uh, commercialize your research results is that don't give up. Um, but in 2019, the tech transfer program is really at its end. It's, it's on overtime really for us. And so we find ourselves at a crossroads uh, with three options, just give up, close down, tossing the towel, find someone else that want to take over the project, another venture from the GU Ventures, perhaps they're interested now, not really that much, or move forward and really, really um, go for this and try to get our project into the uh, Ventures Accelerator program. And very, very lucky for us, um, our contact at Chalmers Ventures thought that we should go for the accelerator and really move forward because this was such a good idea. So that's what happened. And uh, therefore, uh, Shamus Ventures, before the summer of 2019, employed a project manager, uh, Milton, he's on the left picture down here, in order to prepare sort of the project for the accelerator, because this is really nothing for me or Stura. Uh, we are scientists or researchers, we don't know entrepreneurship. And Milton was a last year entrepreneurial student and was really, uh, really eager to get this going. And he did super well. He manages to get our project into the accelerator program uh, by the fall of 2019. And um, a prerequisite for this uh, is that a company is formed. I'm sure you're aware. Um, so that's why the company Alpha Therapy Solutions is made. And of course, the company takes over the patents from Shamus Ventures. And this is really the, the core of the company. As it was formed, it was Milton, our only and full-time employee, myself and Stura, my colleague, the inventors, uh, Matthias, who is the Shamus Ventures representative, and Fredrik Bergman, who is the chairman of the board. And um, we worked really hard, and Milton uh, mostly, and the approach changed from trying to get a business partner to do the manufacturing in a collaborative way in order to hire a production partner to do the manufacturing of the, of the equipment for us. And really in 2020, uh, a lot of things happened now. We, teams up, we team up with a Dutch production company and we start the, pro the process of producing a commercial equipment based on our prototype and our research results. And that is really starting from the beginning, making a user requirement specification, detailing everything that we have been doing throughout the years. Because of course, we constantly have been improving the prototype, uh, changing bits and pieces here and there in order to make it better because we use it constantly at the hospital in, in our daily research, we use our prototype. Uh, Milton also managed to secure funds for us to be sure that we can do the design process and produce the first module. We have hired a CTO uh, and also the patent has been approved in Europe and in the US. We're still working on it in uh, Japan and China. Um, and um, where are we now? Well, we are uh, working a lot. Um, we are coming to uh, the final stages of our um, project 
uh, by uh, turning the uh, equipment into a commercial one. And in 2020, we will launch our first commercial uh, module. It will not be the clinical one. It will be an R&D module. Um, and it will, well, the working name is Atlas. Perhaps that will be the final name, we'll see. And Atlas is really a compact equipment. We can fit it into a glove box or a hot cell. Um, the idea is that the synthesis part is not limited by the type of vector that you want to use. You can use an antibody or a small molecule. It should be robust with high repeatability. It looks promising. Yields in the same range as manual production. Uh, automation does not make this better. If it is equally good, that is very good. Um, it's most and for, well, first and foremost, I should say, uh, simple. So it can be used by someone that's not an expert, which is not the case with our prototype at all. It will be GMP compliant, which is totally different to what we have today. And we have a research model, which can be transformed into a clinical module, the same platform. So that is sort of the journey from our first research result, trying to automate um, radio pharmaceutical production with astatine uh, and uh, turning it into a company that hopefully this year will be able to uh, provide the market with an equipment that does exactly this. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to do the journey, please do. It's really exciting. <laughs> it's a whole new world, entrepreneurship for me, and but it's, it's fun. And um, don't give up. That's it for me. <laughs>